we had them before and, and this year, and he was so good we had to have him back again the same year. I said to him, oh, we'll have you next year, but we haven't had him back already. And he spoke to us about time, get an important and intriguing story about Pittsburgh's role in the development of the American time system. Ken, Thank you. welcome. Well, by the time seven, at seven forty, does anybody have what, anything different than I have? You have same time. Yeah. Anybody? What, what time do you got? Seven thirty-eight. Seven thirty-nine. Seven thirty-nine. Okay, so everybody has a different time. So the question is, uh, who has the right time, and how do we know? It? So this is a story about that, and Pittsburgh had a big role in. In, in telling that, that story. And uh, I'm sorry, I have to sit here. I just can't stand that. My back is too. So, you probably are not aware that there are many different kinds of time. So if you use a sundial time, it has a name. It's called apparent solar time because apparently, if you set up the sundial correctly, when it comes to noon, you'll have an accurate time for the rest of the day. And that's what people used to use for time. It wasn't important. <coughs> and so uh, that's, that's how they told time with a sundown. Uh, there's also a time called mean solar time. And uh, mean solar time just simply means that you use a clock. So the clock can, you know, it's a mechanical device, and, and early ones were water-operated clocks and things like that. But what they did is they, they, they weren't any better at telling time, but they told time perhaps during the night when the sun wasn't up. You know, you couldn't use it. And so, you know, mean solar time is frequently called clock time, but clocks are notoriously unreliable. They speed up and they slow down for myriads of reasons. The, one of the big reasons is temperature. So if you have a pendulum on a clock, that is a very accurate length. And so if it gets hotter or colder, the length of that pendulum can, uh, long, can lengthen or shortens, and it changes the way the clock is telling time. If you lubricate it too bad, too poorly, it, it, it will change the time. There are lots of different things. If the cures get worn, many different things that will change the time. So, uh, one of the interesting things about uh, using something as a standard, you say, well, the sun comes up every day, uh, and why can't we just use the sun as a standard for time? Well. If you go out and you take a picture of the, the sun uh, every day at the same time, the sun will be in a different place. And uh, <clears throat> so this is a picture of the sun taken every day for a year. And it warms us not every day, but every few days. And you can see that the sun is in a different place at the same time. And this figure eight has a name to it. It's called an analemma. And uh, it's a consequence of the difference between me solar time and apparent solar time. The sundial is only right for one day when you set it up. And the clock is an averaging device. And so the difference between the two is known as the equation of time. And because of this variability of where the sun will be, uh, it's not a good object to use as a standard. You can't go out and measure where it's at because it's in a different place every day. So we have to find another way to do something. We have to find another thing to do. And actually, you've probably seen this since, since you were a small child because a lot of globes have this weird figure on the globe. And that's an analemma. And all these times mark, marks the difference in time. And some the time could be as much as uh, 20 to 30 minutes off, different from one time of the year to another. 
So that can't be used as a stamp. So we come to this figure, the, the earth going around the sun. The candle was supposed to be the sun. And this is a very special day. As a fact, matter of fact, it's tomorrow. This is called the uh, summer solstice, the first day of summer. In the northern hemisphere, it's the longest day of the year. And this is the spring of the vernal equinox. This is the autumnal equinox, and this is the winter solstice. So the longest day of the year in the northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, it's the shortest day. So I, I use that to tell you that the days, in, you, you know obviously that days lengthen and shorten, and in the winter time they're very short. And so uh, there, there has to be some reasoning behind that, and it's, that has to do with the tilt of the axis of the Earth. And we also know that the Earth rotates on its axis, right? You know that. Uh, so we we call this a day. And what is it? What is a day? A, a number of uh, a finite number of day, uh, of hours. How many hours? So how many hours does it take the Earth to rotate once in a day? Twenty-four. Hmm? 24 did I hear? Twenty-three hours. Twenty-three minutes. So, so 24 hours is probably the, the acceptable, but the Earth does not turn in uh, 24 hours, once in the 24 hours, and it, it was repeated here. It's, uh, it's another kind of time. We don't call that, we do call it a day, but the other time is called sidereal time, because the Earth does not rotate once in 24 hours. Rotary rotates exactly 24 hours, 56 minutes, 4.09 seconds. So, if the Earth rotates once in 24 hours and we'll say 56 minutes, just to keep them talking very long, why do we have a day that's 24 hours long? Because if you think about it, if, if you add up for four minutes the difference every day, sometimes noon would be at midnight about 180 days later, just roughly, as, as you do a calculation. So, uh, but sidereal time is important to, was important to ship to people that were sailing ships, to know sidereal time, because they used the stars to tell where the ship was. They used, uh, you know, astronomical devices to measure, you know, at, at, where the stars are, and if they didn't know the time very accurately, uh, then they could end up tens or hundreds of miles away from where they were sailing. So it was important to find out the sidereal time accurately, to, known to, to within one second, some people say a month, but some it's a, once a week. So this clock time or solar time the sidereal time, 23 hours, 56 minutes, and the difference between it and the one day has to do with the Earth is ha having two separate motions. It's rotating on its axis, once in 23 hours and 56 minutes, and it's also moving around the sun. So if you look at the sun, and if you could look at a star at the same time, they would both be in the same place. However, if you let the one day go, this is the Earth, See this, this line means the meridian, that, that's where we're measuring from. So one day later, 24 hour, 23 hours, 56 minutes later, the Earth is pointing to the star because the star is so far away you can't discern the difference in its position. However, the sun is closer, even though it's 93 million miles away, and you can't tell. And so what happens is, it takes the Earth about four more minutes of time to rotate and ends up here before the Sun is again on the moon. See right here? And so that is the 24 hours. That's the difference between the sidereal time and the, the, the uh, mean solar time, the 24 hour day. And that's how we get to it. And we live by the Sun. 
You're sleeping when stars are up, so stars aren't important to you. But the, uh, the sun is important because we live by the sun. So we're solar people, we're not stellar people. And that's where this importance comes. And as I said, if we were solar people and we use sidereal time, then sometimes noon would be at midnight. Sometimes midnight, midnight would be at noon. So we have to do it. But it, and time wasn't important because when you uh, went somewhere where to see somebody in those that era, you know, back in the, the 1800s, you'd say, I'll see you in a few weeks. It's not, I'll meet you down on Grant Street at 1025. It wasn't important because you couldn't get to Grant Street at 1025. It, would, it didn't mean anything. But when these things came along, it did become important because they used rules that said, okay, we have a single track and I'm going to, we have two trains using a single track and there's a train coming from uh, Cleveland and there's one coming from Pittsburgh. And uh, uh, they're supposed to pass in Swickley, say. And so they would have a siding there saying, well, the rules, the book of rules would say, well, to meet the train in Swickley, if you get there, and you have to wait, this train has to wait for the other train to pass. When the other train passes, then you can proceed. Yeah. However, sometimes things break down, like the train breaks down, or something happens, or whatever, and the other train's not there. Well, you, you can't let them wait forever not knowing when the train's going to come. So the rules made adjustments for that. And they said, okay, if you get this quickly, and the other train that has the right track doesn't get there for, say, 15 minutes, then you could proceed. And you have to proceed with caution because this other train might show up, but then it might not be. So they made rules to get around that because they didn't have things like radios. They didn't trust, telegraph was new, and even if, even if it, it was available to use, you, uh, uh, couldn't, uh, uh, they didn't rely on it, they didn't trust it, because it was a newfangled device. And so it was, this time was important to prevent this, train things. And, and that, that made it important to America. Before then, it was important for ships. It was important to countries like England. They are the ones that developed the, this time thing uh, sidereal time and, and clock time and accurate clocks back way back in the 1700s because they were a seafaring nation. This landlocker nation called America, it wasn't that important. However, the train it became important. So there's all kinds of rules, and here's just some of the rules, and these rules I took out of an 1874 manual for training. And it, it's not important that you know them, but it says that there's a trains of inferior and superior classes, and uh, when two trains of the same class meet on a single track, the one not having the right uh, must put the siding, and it has to be clear of the main track before the, the, the time of the uh, opposing train. A passenger train must not leave the station expecting to meet or be passed at the next station by train having the right track, unless it has the full scheduled time to meet a passing point. Uh, when two or more passenger trains meet of the same class or running in the same direction, they must keep not less than 15 minutes apart. Now, so every one of those, except for the top ones, say there's a ferry or an inferior train, every one of them <coughs> involved time. And there, this, that, that's number rule 81. <coughs> There were several hundred rules from already in 1874. And I have a question for you. If I drive down the road, say I'm driving down Washington Pike, and uh, you leave uh, after me, how do you how do you know that I, you're keeping me 15 minutes in front of you? Now you could do it. It's doable, but that's the kind of problems that you meet. 
You can, by if you get behind schedule, by throwing a flare out that lasts 10 minutes. And if I come across a flare that's still burning, that means you're less than 15 minutes in front of me, so I have to slow down. So there's all kinds of things that go on with this. This is a very, very, very complicated subject. We just look at a clock, we say we'll call somebody on the radio or tell them on our cell phone or something like that. So this, pro this story involves a number of people. One of them is Samuel Langley. He was director of the Allegheny Observatory. He developed this something called the Allegheny Time System of electric time signals. He was a scientist, he was a solar and planetary expert, he was an inventor, he invented a device called the bolometer up at Allegheny Observatory. It's the first time that the exact output of the sun was measured. Uh, before then, they would measure the output of the sun like putting a block of ice in a pan uh, on the ground on a sunny day and measure how much time it took. They would weigh the ice and they would measure how long it took the sun to melt the ice and then they would try to convert that into some useful number. Uh, so it was very, very difficult. But he put a, this barometer on the telescope, it hit a wire and created an electrical current, and they measured the output of the sun immediately. It was, a, it was revolutionary. He was an aerodynamicist. Uh, if you were a betting person, you would have bet that Samuel Langley would have been the first person to fly a plane, not these uh, these uh, weird guys named Wright. You know, they, they, he was on to it. The government had already invested about $50,000 in him and his airplanes. And his airplanes are in the Smithsonian Institution. However, he used steam power as a propeller. You can actually see one that hits uh, one of the halls in the graduate school, what used to be the graduate school of public health. He was also became the secretary of this. Uh, Smithsonian Institution. And they have time. The, the first aircraft carrier was called the Langley. You have Langley, Virginia. You have Langley High School here in Pittsburgh. You have uh, something else. Langley, Langley Air Force Base. Langley Air Force Base, yes. So he was a very important person. And another guy, William William Thaw. He was a local guy, industrialist. Uh, philanthropist. He was probably Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh's biggest philanthropist. He was on the board of director of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, he was the president of the Pittsburgh Hawaiian Chicago Railroad. He was the president of the Pennsylvania Company. He was part owner of the Pittsburgh and Steubenville Railroad. Now, you all know where the Pittsburgh and Steubenville Railroad is because it runs out right through Bridgeville. So it was called they, they call it the Panhandle Railroad or the Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Chicago, and St. Louis Railroad. But originally, it was the Pittsburgh and Steubenville Railroad and Thaw owned part of that. And he was chairman of the observatory committee for Allegheny Observatory, which was a small private observatory originally that Thaw was a member of. And they gave it to the Western University of Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, which is now called the University of Pittsburgh. So he, um, he is the man that hired Langley to come to Pittsburgh. Uh, a little bit of a side, a little bit of history. Thaw had a, a he had a son, but a, a grandson, which I'll mention here, Bill, and his other and his son Harry. Uh, and they're they are well known for two different reasons. Uh, Bill was a, a member of the Lafayette Escadrille, so he was a he was a person that was an American who served in the French Air Force during World War I. He was a very honorable man to serve, you know, to, to in, the, in World War I before America entered the fight. And he was an ace pilot, so that meant he shot he shot down three uh, separate uh, German aircraft. So he was a very honorable man. However. Uh, Thaw's son Harry was not. He murdered the ar architect uh, of uh, New York uh, City's Pennsylvania Station, a man named Sanford White in broad daylight, uh, and murdered uh, uh, him over a woman. Uh, 
one Elizabeth Nesbitt, who strangely enough was also from Pittsburgh. She was from Tarentum. She was a Gibson girl, so she was a very uh, good-looking lady. And uh, Mr. Uh, White used to play the ladies, and Mr. Thaw fell in love with uh, Miss uh, Nesbitt, and so he killed uh, he killed Mr. White in broad daylight. He shot him and in front of uh, in front of everybody, and uh, he was sent to uh, a sanitarium. They found him insane, and he spent uh, a short time in a nice sanitarium in a sanatorium in uh, uh, in Crescent, lived a fine life, and shortly was declared uh, sane and uh, got out. So he got away with murder. Um, there were two movies about it, if you're interested in seeing. One is called The Girl in the Red Velvet Swing. That's a black and white movie from the early 50s. The other one is called Rag Time. It's a modern color uh, film. I've seen both of them. So two different ends of this. The big telescope that's in the Allegheny Observatory is called the Thought Thaw Memorial Telescope. So it's after William Thaw. So just uh, another part of this uh, about railroads and the development of railroads, this is the Erie Canal. So that was an important thing, and it, it, took, it took a lot of business from the Midwest, which would go on the lakes, and then hit the Erie Canal and go over to the Hudson River and down into New York City. And that took money away from these people over this side of the state, which I think I cut off. No, Philadelphia, over here. So they didn't like that. So they started to force the issue to have a canal built. And that's why they built the canal system from over in, uh, to, in Harrisburg over toward the mountains. And then they built the Portage Railroad that separated and they built the rest of the canal down uh, to the Connemont River and then into the Allegheny River and the Pittsburgh to capture that. But that didn't work too well because it had to pass over the mountains. And so they weren't happy about this deal, so they established railroad. They started the, what they call the Pennsylvania Railroad. And that's these green lines. And the Pennsylvania Railroad originally went from Harrisburg to Pittsburgh. But an important thing about this is this red line. That's, called, that's the boundary of economic impact, impact of the Erie Canal. So it stretched far away from the Erie Canal, and it goes all the way down through Pennsylvania through this uh, little town, I don't know what you call that, here, right there? Uh, see, because well, it's Pittsburgh. <laughs> so Pittsburgh was the border of in economic impact of the Erie Canal. Why? Because the Allegheny River went all the way up close to the Erie, Lake Erie. And in a short trip from the uh, Allegheny River, to Lake Erie, short land trip, then you could go by uh, uh, boat all the way to New York City. And so the people in Philadelphia didn't like that, and that's why they formed the railroad, because they were losing money. So it's weird what these, uh, what historic things change people's importance. So, now we can get to a little bit more to the to the story of I don't know what I did here. How you can how you can tell time. As I said, the star the the uh, the Earth rotates once in twenty three hours of uh, fifty six minutes four seconds. And so if you use something called a transit telescope, and that's what this is, a transit telescope, it only moves in one direction, up and down. So I look at a star in that telescope today, and then I wait for the Earth to rotate one time, and that same star comes back. And in this telescope is a crosshair, just like in a rifle stuff, and on a rifle, you have a crosshair. So if it hits the crosshair, Today and then I wait till tomorrow, and I get that same stay same star hitting that that uh, cross here. I know that 23 hours, 56 minutes, four seconds has passed. So if I look at my clock, 
I can tell if the clock is correct or incorrect. And if it's not correct, then I can adjust the clock to the correct time. However, that's a sidereal event. Okay? And uh, that telescope resided in this part of the observatory. The big, te the big 13 inch telescope was in this dome. And in here, you see there's doors, and they just opened these doors up here and through the roof so that they could observe what they call time stars. And then they would record the exact time that those stars hit, that, and they would make an adjustment. And actually, they developed, a, Langley developed a, 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 a system to record that. And we'll show a little bit more. This is in the later observatory, the exact same telescope. And oddly enough, when I was a young kid, and I volunteered in, uh, um, at Allegheny Observatory, uh, I used to sit in that chair. I didn't know what it was for, but I could clearly remember sitting in the chair many times below the top telescope. And it's now, I don't know what happened. Did you ever hear what happened? Or I think I threw it down the stairs. I don't recall ever seeing it. Yeah, I used to sit in it all the time. Uh, and here is it, this modern observatory, same thing. Well, that's the actual telescope that's in. If you go visit Allegheny Observatory, you can see this equipment. And so you had to have two clocks. One was a sidereal clock whose passage of 24 hours went in 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4.09 seconds. And one called the mean solar clock, which passage of time happened in 24 hours, in, in no minutes, in no seconds. And this is the original sidereal clock, which this is made by Frogen, which is a, I'm, I'm, I'm told that this is possibly the only Frogen clock in America. And this is made in England, and Frogen clocks are very valuable. So another view of the observatory, the old observatory, here's where the the uh, so I hear the uh, transit telescope was, and this is the new observatory, and here is the transit house behind the new observatory where they would determine time. That building is, is no longer there. These are the present clocks at the observatory. One's a mean, one's a sidereal clock. That's this one, and one's a mean solar clock. That's this one. So you had to take this clock, get the sidereal time, check this time against that time, and it gets complicated because it's moving off by about four minutes every day. So today they're different by, they're on time, tomorrow they're different by four minutes, the next day they're different by eight minutes, you know, 10 days they're different by 40 minutes. So it gets complicated, you have to make accounts for that. And they also use this, these point to, the little um, the wires that you can hook up to send the signal out electrically and uh, send it out to various devices to help you tell time or, or to, to send that signal out to uh, people in the world over a telegraph line. And <laughs> you say, well, so they're very important historic books and they're still in use today. So the way you would do that is if you would send that to, they would send the signal. There is a, on the second uh, gear, hand gear, the second gear, they put little switches. So every time that the uh, second ticked off, it depressed a little switch that they put in place. And you would get an output from that switch, electrical output from that switch. So tick, tick. Tick, and you would do that on, you could do that on both clocks. Tick, 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 okay, so who cares? Uh, but, as it can, comes around for these, these stars, time stars, to come up, if you're watching those signals, and they're recorded on this device here, you'll, you'll see a little bit better of it, a drum, this is a drum chart, you'll see these lines that come up every time. And this is the actual record. They have no charts. All the charts have disappeared from when they determined time. But it would record on them. So if you would see 
when the clock is supposed to, what time it is, it's recorded on there, and you could write that every second. And when you came up to this star, the observer would press a button, and it wouldn't make another mark because there's already a bunch of marks on there every second. It would actually leave a gap. And so that would be the exact time of 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4 seconds. And you would see whether it record it was recorded as an exact time, and you would see that by the second and by the by this gap between them, and so you could differentiate it to half a second of time. It also, I want you to note that this this drum recorder is not driven electrically; it's weight driven, just like the clock, because. Electricity, when they started sending these signals out, it was in the 1860s, electricity was, a, was something that was a scientific curiosity. It wasn't something that you had to drive motors and everything like that, so everything was weight driven. And it was, it was complicated. And what, else, what did you do with it? So you had the accurate time. Well, Langley developed a way to send these signals out over telegraph. And this is the switchboard to do that. And then you would send this electrical <coughs> signal, again, from the mean solar clock. Now, now that you checked that the sidereal clock was good, and you compared it to the mean solar clock, and you made adjustments, and the way they made adjustments was they would add some weight or subtract some weight, and the weights are still in the, in the clock boxes. You could add that and could change the time to make adjustments. And then that was sent out over telegraph wires to railroads. Now this was be this would be set out as as a tick tick tick. The tick of the clock was claimed to actually change the click of a telegraph wire. So you would hear these click 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 signals, but what does that tell you? So you hear a bunch of click click clicks. Originally what Langley did is he set this clock so that there by a, a complicated system that it could actually slow down or speed up a clock at Harvard Observatory. Because uh, he was a, uh, he was born in Roxbury, Massachusetts, so he had connections back in, in the Boston area. And so they set up a system where he could drive the clocks in Boston to the correct time. And they did that for a while. But, you know, this is America. And what's America noted for? Money. So a telegraph line, people were saying, you have a telegraph line dedicated to adjusting the clock in Boston. How stupid is that? I could be making money by selling people telegraph messages. So Langley had to go back and reinvent this system again so that what they did is they, they would open up the telegra a telegraph line along the railroads, whoever was railroads were involved in this, and they would say, okay, at noon, say five minutes early, I think it's five minutes, it might have been 10 minutes early, no telegraph messages will go across this line. And, <coughs> When, then we'll send a signal to say, you know, all clear, ready for time. And then when you started listening to these ticks, then you would, you would get the correct time. But can anybody tell me what tick, 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 what time it is? Tick, tick, tick. What's the correct time? Well, so what they did is the 59th tooth on the second gear they, they filed it down so it wouldn't compress that little switch. So you would hear this click, 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 click. So when you heard that little gap in there, that you knew that it was the first second of a new hour. Didn't matter what hour, because there were different hours in different places. If, if no matter when you did it, when, what railroad decided to do it at what time, they knew that it was always at the beginning of a new hour. So whatever hour it was, or as many places as you did it for, it didn't matter because electricity travels at the speed of light. So it doesn't matter whether it was in Pittsburgh or in Boston or 
or simultaneously in California. Everybody got it in essentially the same time. And so they knew what the beginning of a new hour was. They checked their clock and they were responsible to set it. And that's why you hear about railroaders having this, this, uh, this fascination with, with watching. Oh man, it's a railroader's watch. Who cares? Well, because the railroaders were responsible. Either the, the railroad itself provided the watch, or if you were a railroader, somebody in, the, in responsibility, responsible position, a conductor or an engineer, you were required to, make, to own and maintain your watch. And when you were to come on to your job, you were required to check your watch against the station clock. And so you were to, required to correct your watch if your watch was fast or slow. And if you were out on the road and some supervisor asked you to, asked to see your timepiece, if it was incorrect, that was a fireable offense. Then you would, today, we say, oh, who cares? But the reason is, if you had a wrong time and you were running by time, paper time uh, schedule, you could be the resp responsible for a wreck. So it became very important, and that's why railroaders' watches were important to people. Because it, that they had to do that because that was a major responsibility of their job. And this thing was the uh, switchboard that sent it out to whoever was hired, you know, was paid. They bought time. Everybody bought time. They paid the railroad, the, Pens the Allegheny Observatory, starting in the 1870s was totally supported by time revenues. Now in the 1870s that amounted to about three thousand uh, uh, dollars uh, a year but you know that was their a big part of their expenses was batteries to keep all this stuff running because they didn't have electricity on wires like we we know it. So that wasn't possible but they needed electricity to send to check these clocks and to send the signals out to the drums and and to put it out on the telegraph wire. So it was a big, important part of their expense, and they sold time. And I think that that partially came about, I cannot substantiate this at all, but since Thaw always supported Langley, this was a way of him paying back Langley for hiring him. And, and the, the, the head of the departments of, of astronomy and physics at, at Pitt, Western University of Pennsylvania, were always angry at Langley because he didn't want to teach classes. And so, and you look at correspondence between Langley and Thaw, and he's saying, they want me to do this, and he didn't want to do that. And they, they said they gave him a house to live in, and that was part of his salary, but you, you Langley never lived in the house because he, he said there was, you could see through the walls. And you know, that was supposed to be a big thing. So he was always in arguments with his, his supervisors and he was always after Thaw to intervene. And it seems like Thaw always did intervene for Langley because he was such a philanthropist. So when this came along, you think, oh, now we know what the correct time is, problem is solved, right? Wrong. <coughs> Everything is always more complicated than you think it is. I told you this about this noon thing, when, this, when the sun goes up in the sky, when it reaches its peak in the sky, in that arc of the sun, that's called the zenith. The stars have zeniths, everything, but it's the, when it reaches the peak in the sky, we call that, that sun reaching the zenith, we call that noon. Now once that happened, and everybody knows accurately what noon is, noon is different in every place, almost every place in the country. So everybody in the United States wanted their time to reflect solar noon. So, as a consequence of this, you can't read this too well, and I have to draw up here to read it. Uh, we have something called city time. So here is Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is, 
Here it is, Pittsburgh. 11, I think it says 1148. Over here we have Chicago. It's 1117. In Cleveland, it's 1141. In Columbus, Ohio, it's 1136. In what, Portland? Portland, Maine, it's 1123. Everybody, there were as many as 80 different and even more city time in, in, the, uh, in the country. So when you travel on a train, if you have a schedule, <coughs> and I'm getting on a train here in Pittsburgh, and say I'm going to Columbus, and I say, oh, Columbus, and when I arrive by my schedule, I arrive in Columbus at this time, and I have to catch a train for another railroad and uh, across town at this time, and I look at their scheduled time, and, but the trouble is, is the railroad that I'm connecting with is not the Pennsylvania Railroad, it's, uh, say, the Erie Railroad or something, I'm just using names, and uh, their headquarters is in a town that uses this town's uh, time as a, as a standard for their schedule, I said, oh, I got plenty of time. I could walk there. Well, when you walk there and the train's gone. Because they're using a different time, a different city's time. So it, because of this, it became very, very complicated to travel and to understand what was going on. So city time, although it gave everybody accurate time, it didn't give them a collectively right time. And it was very difficult to tell. Um, here is where this picture is of uh, downtown Pittsburgh, and this is the this is the Pennsylvania Station downtown, and this is where Langley started sending his time signals to originally to the Pennsylvania Railroad downtown. And this photograph was taken before 1877, and how can I tell? Because in 1877, there was a Pittsburgh Railroad riot and they burned the station to the ground. So this photograph was taken between 1877 and, and 1869. This is where the post office used to be, which is now the federal courts right here. This is Grant Street. And this is the way city Pittsburgh looked way back when, when he started sending signals to there. So Wallace Beardsley, who I had the pleasure of knowing, and who uh, I had learned much about time uh, beforehand, because we would discuss it, and I was a young kid, as I said, and he was a professor, and would talk to me as an adult, and I learned a lot of things when I was a kid. And he's, he wrote, he wrote his, he, he was a guy that had a PhD without the thesis, so he really didn't have a PhD. So in order to get a PhD, he got it in education, uh, before he left the observatory and, and because they were looking to only keep people with PhDs and he wrote his thing, his, his thesis about Langley. And he said the Allegheny system inaugurated in that year is believed to be the parent of all the present ones uh, and as far as it was known the first regular and systematic distribution time, system of time distribution of railroads and cities accepting uh, as official. As official. And so what eventually evolved is there was a two-tiered system. Uh, there were two kinds of times that were important, railroad time and city time. Because a railroad would enter another time by their, they would render, enter a time by their schedule, but the city had a different time. And it gets to be even as stupid as Steubenville, Ohio. Steubenville, Ohio had a city time, and they had, it was 47 minutes difference, I think. But the fact of the matter, 37 minutes difference. So it was three minutes later in Steubenville than it was in Pittsburgh. And that's how, that's how complicated this became. Uh, and and it was, in Pittsburgh itself at one time, there were as many as six different times. And uh, across America, there were more than 80. So it was very, very, something that you would think, well, it's very simple, was was never very simple, it was very complicated. And Langley had a comment on this too. It says, he speaks to this, I'm not gonna bore you with it, but he says, well, when you leave Boston, 
and you get to, you, you're constantly, somebody is calling out the new time. The, con the conductor would come and say, oh, it's uh, Philadelphia time, it's Altoona time, it's Pittsburgh time. He said, and every one of them, every intermediate city in between, there's a different time. And that doesn't matter how good your watch is, you, can't, you don't know what time it is until they call it out because it's all, they're all changing. And so, and, and he said, until you invent a, a, a watch that changes time automatically, it'll never be cured. And it never was, except for now. And do you have an idea what that is? It's called a cell phone. <laughs> Because when you go into a new time zone and you hit the first cell tower in the new time zone, it changes your, your, your uh, cell phone to the different time. So he was actually a good predictor. We actually have in our country, a, a, in the Smithsonian, a curator of time. Why we need one of them, I don't know, but we're paying somebody that has a high level. And she wrote a book, she, I've spoken to her, and she said the Pennsylvania Railroad was probably the first major railway to systematically govern timekeeping along these its line. And all the company's timepieces were synchronized from time signals from Allegheny Observatory. Other, other observatories did, did uh, um, Due time. Langley is the one that convinced them to establish the, the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. because the, the Signal Corps, the military, was in charge of time and importance. And it was important that the military know correct time. So he encouraged them to develop the Naval Observatory. And so they were recommended that you, you buy your time from, which you know, was actually free from the Naval Observatory but the Western Union charged a fee to do it. Uh, and so they encouraged uh, that uh, you get it from uh, the Naval Observatory. However, railroads, most, the uh, majority of railroads used actually Allegheny Observatory's time. Uh, I'm not gonna do it. This is a number of the railroads that were involved here in Pittsburgh. And uh, they are all, Pennsylvania Railroad Railroad. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but in, what I wanted to set, talk to you about, though, is that the Pennsylvania Railroad ended in downtown Pittsburgh. You know where the Pennsylvania Apartments is, Pennsylvania Station, right downtown? That is actually where the Pennsylvania Railroad ended. And so for them, uh, when people were talking about standardizing time, for them, it was convenient that the, the time, divisions in time and standard time end there. Because then, from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia and New York, it could all be in one schedule in one time when you're developing time systems. The time, uh, time zones. The railroads developed time zones. The United States government did not develop time zones. Railroads developed time zones. Had nothing to do with the government. They had no input into it whatsoever. It was all a business decision. And so it was convenient for the Pennsylvania Railroad to have the Pennsylvania Railroad all in one time zone. Time zone. And they were very powerful. They were probably the most powerful railroad in the United States. They were one of, they were, by most statistics, they were probably the most, the biggest and the most important railroad in the United States. Some people that would like New York Central would probably argue with me about that, but in fact, it's this way. And here in Pittsburgh, since that railroad ended, and all these other railroads started, and these were all part of the Pennsylvania Railroad. They were stock companies, but they were all part of the Pennsylvania Railroad. They were operated from Pittsburgh, and it would be convenient then to put these railroads into the other time zone so that they could have a continuous schedule all the way to Chicago. So now we have these very simplified system for the, for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Lines West, which was here in Pittsburgh, came in the central time zone. Lines East 
would come in the Eastern time zone and it would simplify operation for them. Well, what, if, what about a railroad that was on the border, like the Baltimore and Ohio? Well, that's a problem for them. Who cares? We got our business taken care of. And they did it. Now, I put an error. So Lions West schedules were based on Columbus time at that time when they, when they did this thing. And this is just something to indicate <coughs> that this division was here. There's something called Pennsylvania Lions West of Pittsburgh. Again, the Northwest system, that was, the, that was the Fort Wayne, the line that goes through the north side. The Southwest system was the line that comes through here at Carnegie and out west. And lines west, of, lines west of Pittsburgh, general offices were in Union Station, Pittsburgh. I'm just developing this thing that this uh, was a complicated business organization that got what they wanted. So the General Time Convention was came about. They recognized this problem with scheduling between railroads, between times, between everything, and they were put in charge of coordinating scheduling. They were in charge of resolving the time discrepancy between railroads, and uh, you know how complicated this is. Uh, one of the questions they asked for the time convention was, who do you hold responsible for rear-end collisions at the station, the train standing in the station, or the train approaching it? Now, if you were sitting out in uh, at, uh, out on uh, the Washington Pike and somebody hit you in the back, you would say, you would call the police and say, hey, this guy struck me in the back. And then what would you say if the, the uh, cops come up and says, well, he says that's your fault. He hit you, but he says it's your fault. And, and he, you'd say, are you crazy? He hit me in the back. Well, with trains, trains were in stations and they have schedules. And if they're supposed to be gone from the station at uh, 1230, and I hit you in the back at 12.31, guess what? It's, it's your fault. It's the train staying in the station's fault because he didn't send out protection on the rear end of the train to stop the train from hitting him. And so these things get complicated, and they, again, it had more rules. And this is the depth of the detail that they looked at about it. And lo and behold, standard time comes about in 1888. The railroads decided to break the country up into four time zones. Actually, they did it five time zones, but we don't pay attention to Atlantic time. And so these colors, and this is not a good map, but again, this red is the eastern time zone, and the red ends right here in this little town called Pittsburgh. So, Central time zone began in Pittsburgh. So this was standard time began in 1883 at this station. In 1902, when central time zone began until 1918 when they changed it. The complication of this is that some of these people here at the Pittsburgh station are in the eastern time zone. And some of these people here are in the central time zone. These people over here are in the central time zone. These people over there are in the eastern time zone. So, guess who didn't go along with that? The city of Pittsburgh. <laughs> Why? Why would you do this? You're saying you want us to break up the city of Pittsburgh into two time zones at 11th Street. <laughs> okay, well, that didn't go over too big. More accurately, you see these red little two red poles, and that blue line? That is where the eastern and central time zones changed. So the city didn't agree to it, and so for a while, we continued with the city being on city time, and then the railroad being on Eastern Time, the Pennsylvania Railroad, and the Lines West being on Central Time. And the difference between City Time and the Railroad Time was not even. So it was 20, it was 20 minutes going east and 40 minutes going west. 
So when you got on a train in Pittsburgh, on the Pennsylvania Railroad at least, to go west, you had to know what direction you were going and what the difference between city time and uh, central time was, 40 minutes, or if you were going east and you had to know what it was between city time and eastern time. That is, except for the trains that were in the station that were not on those times because they were, uh, like if you were going to Butler and you were, uh, and it was complicated. Here, it was until, and I can't identify when, uh, but in 1918 the government gets involved with, with a controversial subject called daylight savings time. It was, it was so controversial that the law was repealed in 1990. And so, and since then, it's just been you choose whether you want to use it or you don't want to use it. There's no law that says you have to. It was a it's a complicated subject. But now, the Pennsylvania Railroad, I mean, the city of Pittsburgh did eventually get go with Eastern time. And when exactly that was, I can't tell you, but it was before 1902, I believe. Uh, so that, uh, that, I didn't want to go through, dig through mounds and mounds and mounds of my pages and pages of, of data for train schedules. But surprisingly, you might find out that this whole story came about because of my interest in trains. And one day, I was looking at this picture, which I published in a book, and I got out a, uh, I got out a microscope, I got out a loop, and I looked at this tower on, this is a Federal Street Station, this is Allegheny. I looked at that, and I looked at the clock, and it's, I could read Central Time. I said, Central Time, oh, that means that, that must mean that this face of the clock says, Eastern time, and then this one says Central time, and that one says Mountain time, and then that one over there says Pacific time. I said, "Oh, that's that's pretty neat." And so years went by until I found another photograph. This one, this photograph that I found, and I said, "I said, I'm going to see Eastern time," and I look at this picture, and it says Central time. I said, "What?" And so now I have to do a lot of research to find out is the reason why it's that way is because this was the first train station in the central time zone from Pittsburgh. Even though it was nine-tenths of a mile away, it was the first train station in central time. And that's what led to the story, which I published in Western Pennsylvania History, about a little more than 10 years ago. So be careful what you look at because it might mean a lot of work. I just want to show you, I put these schedules up here that tells about the story. That This is uh, Allegheny Valley Railroad stand follows Eastern Standard Time, uh, Pennsylvania Company, the Pittsburgh, Fort Wayne, and Chicago, and some other railroads. Central Time is 40 minutes slower than Pittsburgh Time. Pennsylvania Railroad, Remember I told you they burned a train station down in Pittsburgh in 1877. They didn't even tell you what time that went by because they were still mad at, at, uh, at people in Pittsburgh. And this schedule was uh, in 1885. And so I, I say, it's a complicated story, the confusion and slowly. It was time, Pittsburgh city time ends after 1883, but before 1902, uh, with the adoption of Eastern time. Central time ends in Pittsburgh with federally mandated uh, daylight savings time in 1918. So for 20, for 35 years, the um, central time zone began in Pittsburgh. And uh, besides the room, people in this room, there aren't too many other people that know that. It's so it's an amazing story that that nobody knows that the Central Time Zone began in Pittsburgh. The PRR ends the purchase of time signals from Allegheny Allegheny Observatory in 1921, um, and they adopted the free 
uh, naval time signal, time signals from the naval uh, observatory, and the time signal uh, era in Pittsburgh itself ends in 1946, because up until that time, the city of Pittsburgh, at the old uh, old city hall, which was further down uh, uh, Smithville Street, they had a clock tower on the city hall, and that clock was kept, kept accurate by uh, time signals from Allegheny Observatory. Now, who else would buy time? I'm, well, some of the people that purchased time from the observatory were like jewelers. Well, why would a jeweler buy time? Because jewelers had sold watches. <laughs> they sold watches and clocks. And so, as part of the deal, some of these jewelers that had this accurate time would say, well, if you buy your watch for me, I will let you come into my jewelry store anytime you want and set your watch to the correct time. And that's part of the deal to sell a watch. So there was those kind of things that happened. So it's a very, very complicated story about something that today we think nothing of because time is given to us by atomic clocks that we don't have to do anything with. Listen to the radio broadcast to tell us the right time or the beep that you hear between hours on the radio that tells you that that's a new hour and that's all you have to do to find or use your your uh, uh, cell phone. You ask anybody what's time, they don't look at their watches anymore. Young people don't have watches. They don't wear them because it's on their cell phone. They don't use it. They don't need it. They don't care for it. And it's all done you know, more accurately with the Tom clocks. So anybody have any questions about it? I'm sure I gave you more information than you ever care to know <laughs> on the subject. Yes, Bill? When did the four time zones as we have get firmly established? 1883. That was set up by the railroads. It was all came on in November. I think it was in November. But Eastern time now goes clear through most of Ohio into Indiana. It goes all the way to it goes all the way to Chicago line, except for a little bit of Indiana. Right. Because I was. So up. when was that border set? It, that happened. It, who know? I don't know. It wasn't established clearly. It wasn't a move from Pittsburgh to to Illinois. It was. It happened in steps. And I've never been able to follow that out. As a matter of fact, I got into trouble. I missed the plane because I started flying. I lived in Valparaiso, Indiana for a while when I worked in Chicago. And I was uh, catching a plane. It, told, it either took me an hour and a half or three hours to get to O'Hare Airport. So I avoided flying out of O'Hare whenever possible. And I decided, even though it was a uh, two-hour drive almost to Indianapolis, I started flying out of Indianapolis. Because what's the difference between two hours one way or two hours the three hours the other way? So, and I actually I got cheaper fares out of there. And almost invariably, I had to fly to Chicago to get my connecting flight. But <laughs> Indiana didn't uh, didn't use stay, uh, daylight savings time at that time. So sometimes you were the same time as East, and sometimes you were the same time as Chicago. So it did depend. Well, I had a flight out of uh, Indianapolis, and I called the airport, and I realized that I didn't take into account that it wasn't daylight savings time, and I, so I called the airport in, in, in Indianapolis, and they said, oh, it's okay, the plane is late. Uh, leave it late, you can get here anyway. I said, no, you don't understand, I'm in Valpo, and it's going to take me almost two hours to get there. She said, oh, okay, well, we'll get you on a different flight. So I get down there, and the same plane is still there. I said, well, can I, can I just drive to O'Hare and catch the plane there? And they said, absolutely not. No, they don't let you do that. So I drove to Indianapolis, flew to Chicago, and missed my flight to San Francisco anyway. So <laughs> it doesn't matter. But uh, that kind of stuff is what happened. Yeah. So one rotation of the Earth yes. is not evenly divisible by 24. That's exactly right. However, 
to get the sun to the same spot in the sky, it, it is equally divisible by 20, by 20. Oh, it is. To get the sun to the same spot, not to get a star, a star to the same spot. So that was the complication. People didn't know that the Earth rotated like that. I mean, the only scientists knew, and you know, they didn't care. Nobody cared. The, I told you, even after they solved the problem of the Biden, everybody wanted their 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 time to represent mean solar noon, which complicated everything. Yes. You know, when I was a kid growing up in the country, I remember when we got our first black rotary phone. If you didn't know what time it was, you would call the operator. Yes, yeah. 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 free. I'll tell you a simple way you can tell by this. If you if you palm a if you palm a stick in the ground and you watch you when you watch the shadow of the stick get to its shortest point and you mark that, then then you you uh, wait till the next day if heaven forbid you don't live in Pittsburgh and it's a clear <laughs> day, the next day you you mark where the shortest shadow is and it's gonna be moved. And, and so you work that, and you could make that part of that analemma by, by doing just that and, and, and seeing the difference, yeah. So who first came up with the idea of 24 for a day? <coughs> uh, that's too far, too far uh, back, you know, it's probably... It's been that way for a long time. Yeah, uh, I, I couldn't even attempt to answer that. You know, it's going to be answered by a cell phone. <laughs> I, I don't even think it'll be on there. I don't know. Yes. It goes back at least 2,000 years because the account of the day of Christ's crucifixion, they talk about it. Third hour, 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 ninth hour. Yeah. They, they, yeah. They, yeah. The zero hour was 6 a.m. sun, so the third would be 9 a.m., the sixth would be high noon. So they didn't even know that the earth was round. Although I think it was Eratosthenes is the one that did it. He he walked from Alexandria. He walked from somewhere to Alexandria, Egypt, and he just happened to wherever he was in in uh, I think it was in in Turkey or somewhere in Turkey, and he looked out a well and saw that the the sun was looking directly down the well, and so when he walked to Egypt and he looked down the well, there was this shadow cast. And by that, he met, he made an estimate of that, and he said, "By gosh, the Earth is round because the sun is not above, straight above, in every place. So the Earth, the Earth is not flat; it's round. So he predicted that." Over 2,000 years ago, by doing looking down a well, there are some really smart people out there for thousands of years. Really smart people that can figure things out. Yes. Uh, when I was in college in the early 60s uh, in Kentucky, there are two time zones, you know, central yeah. and eastern, down through the middle. And then during daylight savings time, uh, there would actually be four time zones in the state because. Uh, People could choose whether they were going to be standard or or uh, daylight savings. Now there there are still two states that do not have standard time uh, daylight savings time. Arizona never adopted it. Hawaii there's no reason for it. So they did not have daylight savings time. Indiana used to use when I lived there they used to have it. Now they have adopted daylight savings time to end complications like exactly what I was telling you happened to me. Also, people in Indianapolis didn't care what happened in the rest of the state, and so they closed the polls. I went home one, one time to uh, vote, and I was late, and I was, I said, I was, I was hustling to, to get to the polls on time, and I get there, and I'm saying, man, I got plenty of time, and the person in the poll says, oh, you're lucky, I'll, I'll give you a pass. I said, what are you saying? I'm not the right time. The polls closed by in Indianapolis time. They didn't close by Chicago time. And so we'll let you vote. We're going to let you vote. What do you mean you're going to let me vote? I said, what's the time? Nope. The polls 
in the whole state of Indiana are on whatever it was, standard time or daylight savings time, I don't remember back. Yes? There's a little third story I heard one time with the time with the railroads and time pieces. Yeah. There was a, a railroad agent up in, I believe it was Chicago, who received, they also handled the, the products that came Watch out. it, yeah. He received a couple of loads of the time pieces. Yeah, I, I heard that. Same, and, same uh, story. Yeah. Yeah. You heard that one? Yeah, you can say I saw it to the other people. The uh, fellow called the place that had sent them. Nobody picked them up, and the place told them, well, you can keep them, that place paid for these, and they went bankrupt, so as far as we're concerned, throw them away, do whatever you want with them. So this agent contacted a buddy of his, and they sold all these timepieces off because everybody bought them up quick because they figured a railroad clock, they must be real good timekeepers. So they made a lot of money, they ordered more pieces from this company, and they sold them again like this and made the money, so they did this a few times. So they finally both decided to quit their jobs with the railroad, and they started their own little company. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important name. I don't remember the name of the company, but well, it's... Well, one guy was Sears, and the other guy was the Robux. Robux. yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was, yeah. That <laughs> was yeah, an interesting story. I would notice from personal experience, but Howard tells me that some bars wouldn't go on daylight savings time. So they could stay open longer in the summer. Is that still legal? <laughs> uh, well, there's a lot of people that wouldn't do it. I'm sure. I, I never. I can't understand why. If they, they started this saying that there was an hour longer of daylight that you could keep an hour longer of daylight, but why don't you just tell the people to come to work an hour later and you would have that same hour of daylight? <laughs> I mean, it, why do you have to change your time zone? I still don't agree with. It. However. You know, farmers get up and then no matter what. When it gets light, they they start their work. When it gets dark, they stop their work. And but almost everybody else says, "Well, I like a lot. Most people like having a longer day in the summertime. You know, because the earlier hour would be in the in the morning, and they don't want to get up earlier, and so they enjoy having the hour later in the day. But uh, you know, I, I'm I'm for if you want to. Use more hours of the day and get up earlier. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't like I to say like that. Stood up something with the school kids. They were more likely in the morning when you go. Uh, it had to do with more production. Process. It had to do with war production. Well, and energy use. And World War War War. There, there is no. There have been a bazillion studies. There is no savings in energy at all. And that's been my contention also. But when they changed the the beginning and end dates of daylight savings time this last time around, they said it will result in a net national energy savings. They did that also back in the early 1970s. I was a kid in grade school at the time. I don't think and it was dark when I was waiting I don't for the bus to get any it was dark. Uh, That's another reason why they do kids going to school. They say that was, but no matter what, you're gaining here, you're losing here, except for certain, a few certain instances. And the, what they also found out also is that right around the time changes, the more people have heart attacks and more people have get yeah. sickness, and this, the, they have more stress. You know, it's There's like all kinds of things that happen around when you time change the time from, from one time standard to another time standard. So there are benefits and there are there are negative aspects of both both things. Okay. Hope, uh, hope you find something